Welcome back. In this section, we'll be talking about cardiac mechanics. In this section, we will discuss cardiac mechanics. You'll hear the term afterload quite a great deal when talking about cardiovascular physiology. Afterload is simply the force that the heart has to overcome in order to eject blood. Afterload is also known as systemic blood pressure or aortic blood pressure because that is the pressure which the heart has to work against to open the aortic valve. Afterload can also be equated to systolic wall tension, meaning as the aortic valve is opened, how much tension is there in the left ventricle. You can also equate it to left ventricular systolic pressure. Afterload is important because the higher the afterload, the harder the heart is working. This is why we encourage patients to have a lower blood pressure, because with a lower blood pressure, the heart is not working so hard. Preload is another term that confuses people. Preload is quite simply the amount of tension there is in the cardiac muscle prior to systole. It can be equated to the end diastolic pressure of the left ventricle, meaning how much blood is there in the left ventricle before systole. Common indices that we use to measure preload, again, are EDP and EDV, which is the end diastolic pressure and the end diastolic volume. We also use the wedge pressure, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a surrogate pressure, if you remember, to the left atrial pressure. We also use end diastolic wall stress, which is more difficult to measure. The basic measurement for end diastolic wall stress includes the pressure in the chamber times the radius of the chamber divided by 2 times the wall thickness. This is more of an academic definition. In general, you'll be using end diastolic pressure and wedge pressure to measure preload. Another important part of cardiac mechanics is the contractile state of the ventricle. How much contractility the ventricle has is all based on the amount of calcium present in the individual cardiac myocytes. Positive inotropy, or increased contractility, is caused by beta agonists such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, increased extracellular calcium, which is then taken up by the cell, also cardiac glycosides such as digoxin, and increased heart rate. All of these increase the amount of calcium inside cardiac myocytes. Negative inotropy is caused by calcium channel blockers, acidosis, beta blockers, ischemia, chronic alcohol use, and a decreased heart rate. Why is inotropy important? As inotropy or contractility goes up, the heart is able to increase the amount of stroke volume it generates per beat. The heart will contract in two different ways. The first way is isometric. During isometric contraction, the muscle length is constant. This occurs during isovolumetric contraction, the first part of systole. This occurs, again, before the afterload is overcome, before the aortic valve is opened. Isometric contraction is affected by the resting muscle length. If the resting length is low, then the force development is also low. If the resting length is high, meaning there's no more blood in the chamber, then the force development has to be higher in order to push that blood out. Some patients who have too much stretch of their cardiac myocytes, such as patients who have left ventricular failure, these patients can develop poor cardiac outputs because their muscles are too far stretched. This is easily explained by the Frank Starling mechanism which we will talk about. Isotonic contractions occur after the afterload is overcome, after the aortic valve is opened. The force during isotonic contraction remains constant as the blood is pumped out. During this time, muscle fiber length will shorten. These two curves represent the amount of force that is generated as the myocardial fiber level is increased. The systolic curve represents the amount of force generated 
for a certain amount of stretch. As the heart stretches out, it's able to generate less force. So as you can see in general, as stretch increases to the right of the chart, force goes up. There is a maximum point at the top of the chart where the cardiac myocytes are at an optimum level of stretch. At that point, they're able to generate the highest amount of force. Overstretch occurs as you go past that point to the right. The maximum amount of force goes down after you reach the maximum point. This occurs in patients that have heart failure. Too much stretch leads to decreased force production. The diastolic curve on the bottom represents how much pressure is generated by stretching out a heart that is not contracting. The systolic curve represents a contracting ventricle. The diastolic curve represents a relaxed ventricle. You can think of diastole as filling up a balloon with air. As you fill up a balloon with air, the amount of pressure in the balloon will go up. The same thing with the heart. As the heart fills with blood, the amount of pressure in the heart will go up as well. It is impossible to go above or below these two curves in the heart. It's impossible to generate more force than the systolic curve. And it's impossible to generate less pressure than the, diastol than the diastolic curve. These are your boundaries for your cardiac cycle. Isotonic contraction occurs as fibers shorten. What this graph shows is that as afterload increases to the right, the velocity of ventricular contraction goes down. We've already discussed that as the systemic blood pressure or afterload increases, the heart is not able to contract very strongly against that increased blood pressure. This is why we recommend that our patients have low blood pressure. This diagram entitled cardiac contractions shows that there are two phases to the cardiac contraction. There is isometric contraction and isotonic contraction. From point A to point B, you have high isometric contraction. There is no shortening, but there is increased force production. From point B to point C, you have constant force, meaning you've overcome the aortic valve. However, the amount of shortening will increase. The Frank Starling mechanism, which determines the amount of work based on preload, is illustrated by this curve. On the x-axis is time from 0 seconds to 0 0.5 seconds, and on the y-axis is ventricular pressure. And as you can see, during the cardiac cycle, the heart can generate pressure and then it relaxes as pressure goes up and goes down. Starting out with three different levels of preload, as you can see on the y-axis, meaning three different amounts of left ventricular and diastolic pressure, the heart is able to generate three different levels of ventricular pressure during systole. This has nothing to do with contractility. This has to do with using the heart's innate elastic contractile force to generate more pressure. The basic concept is the more you fill the heart, the more it will retract and generate more pressure during systole. Also, as contractility goes up because of intracellular calcium, the heart is able to generate more pressure with a given preload. The darker curve here in brown shows positive inotropy. As you decrease inotropy from positive to normal to negative, you can see the maximum ventricular pressure and the speed at which the heart is able to generate that pressure over time goes down. This is the definition of increased contractility. 
A volume pressure loop, which you may see on the test, combines the frank starling mechanism with the cardiac cycle. The volume pressure loop defines systolic and diastolic function and can also highlight abnormalities in patients that have certain conditions. The volume pressure loop is affected by preload, afterload, and contractility. On this slide, we have an example of a volume pressure loop. The dark lines in the chart you may recognize. These are your systolic and diastolic pressure boundaries. On the y-axis, you have ventricular pressure, and on the x-axis, you have left ventricular volume. Remember that going from an end systolic volume to an end diastolic volume requires diastolic filling. The difference between end diastolic volume and end systolic volume is your stroke volume. Starting at point one, which is the opening of the mitral valve, you have the beginning of diastole. Diastolic filling occurs from point one to point two as left ventricular volume on the x-axis increases from 42 to 125. From point two to point three, you have the beginning of systole. During this time, the pressure increases as you go from point two to point three. However, the volume remains at 125 milliliters. At point three, however, the aortic valve opens. Once the aortic valve opens, you move from point three to point four. The volume goes down from 125 to approximately 100. But the pressure continues to increase as the heart contracts. This is the systolic ejection phase. At point four, you have your maximum pressure in the aorta and in the left ventricle. From point four to point five, you have the reduced ejection phase. And at point five, the aortic valve closes. From point five to point one, you have the beginning of diastole, which is isovolumetric relaxation. These pressure volume loops change greatly as you go from a normal person to a person with, for example, heart failure. Again, point one is mitral valve opening and the beginning of diastolic filling. Point two is the closure of the mitral valve and the beginning of isovolumic contraction. Points three and four involve aortic valve opening and rapid ejection. Rapid ejection ends at point four, and reduced ejection occurs from point four to point five. At this point, you're able to calculate your stroke volume by taking the end diastolic volume, which is 125, and subtracting out 42. This gives you a stroke volume of 83. At point five, you have aortic valve closure. From point five to point one, you have isovolumic relaxation. From a volume pressure loop, you're also able to calculate stroke work, which is your stroke volume times the mean arterial pressure. Preload is generally represented by point two. After load is generally represented by point five. Contractility is represented by the slope of the peak systolic volume pressure curve. As that curve shifts up and to the left, you have an increased contractility. As it shifts down and to the right, you have a decreased contractility. In the next graph, we'll show some changes in preload. Taking the patient from before, who had an end diastolic volume at this point, EDV1, and increasing their preload to EDV2, what will happen is that the stroke volume will increase from SV1 to SV2. This is the Frank Starling mechanism. The heart will stretch out more 
but then is able to pump out more due to increased wall tension. Increasing the preload will increase the stroke volume. By changing the afterload, what we do in essence is we increase the pressure of 0.3. What you see in this chart is a person with an end systolic volume at ESV1 who during diastole goes to EDV, but because the aortic pressure is so high, they're forced to go up to afterload 1. Because they're forced to go that high, the heart has to stop contracting at ESV1. This decreases the stroke volume from SV2 to SV1. A smaller stroke volume occurs with a higher afterload. A decreased afterload causes an increased stroke volume. Suffice it to say that a lower blood pressure allows the heart to have a higher stroke volume. Here you see two systolic volume curves, curve number two and curve number one. Curve two occurs in a patient that is taking a positive inotropic agent, such as epinephrine or dopamine. With a constant end diastolic volume at the bottom right of the curve, you can see that with a constant afterload or a constant aortic blood pressure, the heart is able to generate a higher stroke volume, SV2, by contracting in an environment with a positive inotropic agent by going from EDV to ESV2 instead of ESV1. The increased inotropy allows the heart to beat more strongly with a constant end diastolic volume and a constant afterload. The increased stroke volume causes an increased cardiac output. Again, the goal of cardiac performance is to allow the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to peripheral organs, also to remove waste. How efficiently the heart works is usually measured by cardiac output. Cardiac output is equal to stroke volume, which is in milliliters, times heart rate, which is beats per minute. Cardiac output is the most commonly seen measure of cardiac performance. A person with a normal cardiac output will have approximately a value of 4 to 5. Cardiac index is cardiac output which is divided by the patient's body surface area. A person normally has a body surface area of approximately 1.75 to 2.25. Cardiac output has diagnostic and prognostic value because as a person's cardiac output decreases, it's an indicator of worsening heart failure. Starling's law of the heart says that stroke volume and cardiac output increase as left ventricular end diastolic volume increases as well. A person with left ventricular failure, however, has a decrease in the slope of this curve. A cardiovascular function curve illustrates the relationship between the venous pressure and the cardiac output. An increased venous pressure causes a larger preload. This occurs because the venous return enters the left ventricle and causes left ventricular dilation. A higher preload then causes stronger contractions due to the Frank Starling mechanism and causes an increased cardiac output. The intersection point between the two curves represents the equilibrium point. Cardiac output generally has to equal venous return. First we'll start with cardiac function curves. Cardiac function curves measure cardiac output as the right atrial pressure is experimentally increased. These curves were observed in canine subjects measured over time. What you see on the graph is cardiac output in the Y 
axis and right atrial pressure on the x-axis. In the normal curve, which is blue, you can see that as right atrial pressure increases, the heart is able to increase its cardiac output. This occurs because as the right atrial pressure increases, the left ventricular and diastolic volume increases, and the heart responds by increasing its cardiac output. This is similar to the Frank Starling curve. You can enhance or depress the cardiac function curve by increasing the heart rate or increasing inotropy. Enhancing means to shift the curve up and to the left. Depressing the curve means to shift it down and to the right. The venous return curve is a little more difficult to understand. The cardiovascular system, as you know, is a closed circuit. In general, the rate of venous return has to equal the cardiac output. If these are unequal, then these patients might develop heart failure. An increased volume of blood in the patient causes an increase in mean circulatory pressure. Mean circulatory pressure is the maximum pressure in all the chambers of the blood if the heart were to stop, if cardiac output were to equal zero. All of the chambers would normalize to this mean circulatory pressure. This is influenced by blood volume, sympathetic stimulation, and vascular resistance. The venous return curve, as you can see here in this chart, slopes downward to the right, whereas cardiac output curves slope upward to the right. The venous return curve was measured experimentally as well. It measures the right atrial pressure as the cardiac output is experimentally decreased. On the left side of the curve, you have a cardiac output of approximately 7. The cardiac output diminishes as you cross-clamp the aorta of the patient. If you decrease the cardiac output experimentally, what happens to the right atrial pressure as that pressure builds up? The right atrial pressure increases. So by applying pressure to the aorta and by blocking the cardiac output, you see an increase in right atrial pressure. The maximum pressure that you see in the right atrium is the PMS, or the mean systemic or mean circulatory pressure. In this chart, it's 7. This curve represents the relationship between cardiac output and right atrial pressure. The slope of the venous return curve is represented by resistance to venous return, which is peripheral vascular resistance and high viscosity. Changes in the total blood volume and venous compliance will shift this curve. As you increase the total volume or you decrease venous compliance, meaning you make the vessels less likely to stretch, you will shift the curve to the right. And this is easily understood when you think that at a certain right atrial pressure, you will have a certain venous return. If you increase the venous compliance or decrease the total volume, such as in a patient who is dehydrated, you shift the curve down and to the left. You may ask why the curve flattens to the left of zero right atrial pressure. This occurs because at a zero right atrial pressure, it's difficult to increase cardiac output because at this point, the inferior and superior vena cava are collapsed and more blood is not able to return to the heart when the right atrial pressure is negative or less than zero. The dotted line on this graph represents a right atrial pressure of zero. You're not able to increase your cardiac output higher as you move to the left of that. This next graph shows how the venous return curve changes with systemic vascular resistance. An increased systemic vascular resistance, which is maintained mostly by arterioles, causes the venous return curve to shift to the left Significantly, the slope of the venous return curve shifts to the left. A decreased systemic venous return cur curve 
causes the slope of the Venus return curve to shift to the right with a decreased systemic vascular resistance. There is an equilibrium point that you can measure when the cardiac output curve and the venous return curves are placed on the same graph. As you know, under normal conditions, venous return has to equal cardiac output. For a given level of inotropy, heart rate, afterload, volume, venous tone, and systemic vascular resistance, these function curves will tell you the cardiac output and the right atrial pressure. In this graph, you can see that the venous pressure is a little bit less than 4, and the cardiac output is approximately 6. In this curve, we can see what the effect of exercise is on heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, and venous return. At point 1, the person is at equilibrium. However, exercise causes the red cardiac function curve to shift up and to the left. This is caused by sympathetic stimulation and increased contractility. This shifts point 1 to the left. Also during exercise, the patient will have venous constriction due to sympathetic outflow. This shifts the blue venous return curve to the right so that the new equilibrium point is at point 2. What you can see is that the cardiac output increases greatly from point 1 to point 2 in order to allow perfusion of all the target organs such as skeletal muscle and the heart. This is the cardiovascular function curve in a patient with congestive heart failure. Starting at point 1, the cardiac output curve, which is the red curve, shifts downward and to the right, so that point 1 becomes point 2. As you can see, because of this heart failure, the cardiac output has diminished greatly from approximately 5 to approximately 3. This is not enough cardiac output to support the body. So what the body does is try to artificially increase the cardiac output by shifting the venous curve from the left to the right. This is done by increasing the total circulating volume. The cardiac output slightly increases from point 2 to point 3. The cardiac output becomes approximately 4 in this graph. However, this comes at a cost. The venous pressure increases from about 5 millimeters of mercury to about 8 millimeters of mercury. This also causes an increase in left ventricular dilation. This is why patients with heart failure develop fluid overload and dilated left ventricles. Next we'll do a case study on cardiac mechanics. Use this pressure volume loop to answer the following questions. Number one, what is the end diastolic volume? The end diastolic volume is the volume that's present after filling. And as you know, filling occurs from point one to point two as the volume in the ventricle increases from 70 to 140. Therefore, the end diastolic volume here is approximately 140 milliliters. The end systolic volume in this graph would be 70. Number two, what is the stroke volume? Stroke volume is simply the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. In this case, it's approximately 70, 140 minus 70. What is the ejection fraction? In this case, you take the stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume, which is 70 over 140, which is 50%. Which portions of the curve represent diastole and which portions represent systole? The diastolic portion of the cycle occurs when the ventricle is relaxed. This corresponds to segments 5 to 1, as well as 1 to 2. Systole represents ventricular contraction, and that corresponds to segments 2 to 3 and 3 to 5. 
which portions are isovolumetric? The isovolumetric portions are points 2 to 3 and 5 to 1. During those portions of the curve, there is no change in the left ventricular volume. At which point does the aortic valve open or close? The aortic valve opens at point 3. The ventricular pressure at that point exceeds the aortic pressure. The aortic valve closes at point 5 at the end of ejection. At which point does the mitral valve open? The mitral valve opens at point 1, which is the point where the ventricle starts to fill. As you know, filling occurs when the mitral valve opens, causing the left atrium to open into the left ventricle. At which point would the second heart sound be heard? The second heart sound is caused by closure of the aortic and the pulmonic valves. The second heart sound is caused by closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves. That occurs at point 5. The first heart sound is caused by the closure of the atrioventricular valves, or the mitral and the tricuspid valves. That occurs at point 2, at the end of filling. What is the effect on the prior pressure volume loop when the end diastolic volume, or preload, is increased? What is the new stroke volume? An increased end diastolic volume causes point 2 to shift to the right. Because of the Frank Starling relationship, an increased preload or end diastolic volume causes an increased stroke volume. And as you can see, the end systolic volume here stays the same at 70. What is the effect of increased contractility? What changes occur in the end systolic volume and the ejection fraction? With increased contractility, you can see here in this chart that volume curve 1 becomes volume curve 2. End diastolic volume is constant, but the end systolic volume goes from volume 1 to volume 2. When the end diastolic volume is unchanged and you have increased contractility, the end systolic volume goes from point 1 to point 2. This causes an increase in ejection fraction and an increase in stroke volume. What is the effect of increased aortic pressure, also known as increased afterload? What changes occur in the end systolic volume and the ejection fraction? A higher afterload, or afterload 2, causes the end systolic volume to increase from point 1 to point 2. With a constant end diastolic volume, this causes a decrease in the ejection fraction and a decrease in stroke volume. In general, an increase in aortic blood pressure or afterload causes a decrease in cardiac output. This ends our section on cardiac mechanics. In the next section, we'll be talking about cardiac cell electrophysiology.